We're going to get started here. Welcome everyone to Anabaptist Dialogues, a new webinar series from Anabaptist Witness. I am your host, Jamie Pitts, and I am grateful to those of you who are writing your names and locations in the chat, and I welcome all of you to do that uh, so that we can know who you are and uh, welcome you. It's great to see people from, it uh, looks like, around the US and Canada, um, and Germany, and normally Mexico, <laughs> um, in one case. Uh, today, I am joined by Katie Graber and Annalie Leptisen. Katie is an ethnomusicologist who studies race and ethnicity in a variety of contexts, including Mennonite music, American music, and European opera. Katie was the intercultural worship editor for the Voices Together Hymnal Project and is co-director of the Anabaptist Worship Network. She teaches courses on Western music history and world music at Ohio State University and leads singing at Columbus Mennonite Church in Ohio. Annalee is a PhD student at the University of Ottawa where she studies equity and diversity in congregational music, particularly examining the genre of contemporary worship music. She was also a member of the Voices Together Hymnal Committee and with Katie is co-director of the Anabaptist Worship Network. Annalee enjoys serving as director of Ontario Mennonite Music Camp and attends Ottawa Mennonite Church. Annalee and Katie teach short courses about Voices Together and Mennonite worship through the AMBS Church Leadership Center. Welcome Katie and Annalee. After the interview, we'll, we'll, I'll be in dialogue with Katie and Annalie for the next half hour or so, um, but we will have uh, several minutes, 10 to 15 minutes for uh, questions that you might raise for Annalie and Katie. And if you do have a question, and I hope you will, uh, the way you can communicate that to us is by using the little Q&A box at the bottom, on the bottom Zoom bar. Um, so glad for you to share other kind of thoughts in the chat and as you're doing to continue to introduce yourselves. But if you have a question, I will keep my eye on the Q&A box. Uh, so please drop your question there and when we get to the time for open discussion, uh, I will be looking there to get your questions. But let's get into uh, the main part of our uh, webinar today, which is uh, this discussion with Annalie and Katie. Um, and they have, in addition to all the work they've been doing uh, on Voices Together and the other projects they're involved with, they have uh, they're just finishing, I should say, editing a new issue of Anabaptist Witness on the theme of worship and witness. And that issue is being finalized. It's with our copy editor uh, right now, and uh, you can expect it at the end of this month. And I'll say at the end of our interview um, how you can uh, find that interview, or excuse me, that issue when it is ready. Uh, but so again, the theme of this, this forthcoming issue of Anabaptist Witness is worship and witness. And so Annalie, Katie, I'd like to hear just to start with what your personal experience is with this intersection between worship and witness. Sure, I'd say that um, a recent important event in the life of my congregation, Columbus Mennonite Church, was having Edith Espinal in sanctuary for the last three years. And she um, left sanctuary, thankfully, in um, in February. Um, but that was a, a profound experience of um, bringing together um, a, a, a witness. It, of course, we were doing this for the benefit of Edith, but it was also a witness to our community as a, um, a proclamation of our values about um, welcoming immigrants and refugees and taking care of one another. And it also changed our worship, having her there and um, her family would come to, to our church on Sunday mornings often would um, caused us to, to think about, we had a worship series on sanctuary on the historical and, and um, 
spiritual dimensions of sanctuary. And um, a couple people in our congregation wrote a sanctuary prayer that we said in English and Spanish for many weeks. And um, and then the witness portion of it, um, it, it, it was it was just so um, they were they were so connected, you couldn't take them apart because at the same time, we had events at our church that brought in community members and people would join us and we would join other people at protests and things like that. So that was a um, just one interesting um, ongoing event that brought these two things together. I'd say for myself, it goes back to um, growing up and the church that I grew up in or spent spent kind of my teenage years in, um, was a church plant based in Kitchener-Waterloo called The Gathering um, that my my dad started and was the pastor of. And so I that started when I was about 10 years old, um, and I was there till I left for university. And um, the, the whole, so the church, we didn't have a building. Um, we were really intentionally in kind of an emerging neighborhood, um, lots of school-aged kids, um, lots of new, um, kind of developments and we did a lot of you know fun fairs and free pancake breakfasts and just so many community events which I absolutely loved um, as a teenager getting to do the soft serve at the fun fair and whatever it was it was a really wonderful experience um, but but there were so many connections between that and the worship that we participated in and that's interesting for me to reflect on as a teenager who wasn't particularly involved in worship leadership. Um, but noticing, I, if I think back, I can think of how many times people would come to our church um, and they'd be walking into the school that their kids attended. So they've been to this school many, many times. They've watched, you know, games in the gym that we're worshiping in. Um, and then the ways that our worship was designed to really feel welcoming to folks who had not been part of church services before. And so I think about the clothing we wore. Um, never in my life did I, I have any kind of dress up for Sunday. Um, I mean, I did because it was fun, but there was no pressure to do that. Um, and, and the you know, it's a familiar space. We've just got you know, volunteers around and chairs that were unstacking, but then the worship was really designed to be accessible. And so for me, that was a transition from going um, from primarily hymn singing congregations to contemporary worship music. Um, and the way that that music sounds like what you hear on the radio. And so if you are used to, if you're someone who, you know, drives to work, listening to the radio, has it in the background during supper, you're able to participate in worship because it sounds familiar to you and there's no precedent of needing to be able to read music or um, you know have any kind of classical music training and so the way that our worship and witness intersected I love Katie's example and my example because they're so different um, and both so so unique and interesting um, and so for me that that intersection was about our worship being really really accessible to folks who had not really participated in church before yeah, you're right. Those those questions or your responses uh, tie together both the kind of ordinary, how the regular pattern of ordinary worship um, can be, you know, through its intentional uh, attention to accessibility and so forth can be part of the church's witness. And Katie, you're talking about kind of more extraordinary, even though I know it, <laughs> it lasted quite a long time. Um, the sanctuary uh, process at Columbus Mennonite, but um, a kind of more extraordinary uh, out of the usual that really disrupted your um, your ordinary uh, rhythms of worship and and yet was a, a, a mode of witness for you. So thanks for sharing those. Now, I've mentioned that you both were active in the Voices Together hymnal. And for those who are not familiar with that hymnal. This is a, a new hymnal that's been released recently for, oh, there we go, uh, produced by and for uh, Mennonite Church Canada and Mennonite Church USA. So it's the new denominational hymnal for these two denominational bodies. And I know both of you have been deep in this project for a long time. And so I'm curious, how would you see this, how, you know, how did your work on the Voices Together hymnal shape your understanding of this relationship between worship and witness? Well, one of the things that comes to mind for me in my work with Voices Together was um, I did a lot of thinking about Beyond Sunday is what it's called. So this was with my worship resources hat, which is the, the words for worship at the back of the book. Um, 
And we, one of the things that our, our editor, Sarah Johnson, um, kind of called us to think about was where are hymnals that are not Sunday morning worship um, or an, a variation of Sunday morning worship and, and what resources might be helpful there. And so one of the resources that we um, were intentional about trying to find and ended up kind of including several pieces that could fit with this is something for public protests and blessing public protests. Um, and so that's an example of how, um, you know, we are able to see public protests as an act of worship. And by resourcing those, uh, we're able to kind of bridge these two pieces that Katie kind of already articulated are so inseparable in many ways. Um, and so there are other, you know, there's a beautiful song and voices together in the text, just how can our anger give life? Um, kind of these resources that really call us to think about our public action and how that connects to our worship. Um, I'm really intrigued by um, paperless singing. There's a really excellent organization called Music That Makes Community that does a lot of this, teaching folks paperless music. Um, and they they do a lot of that kind of outdoors in the city, in the town, wherever they are, um, kind of the whole idea is that you don't, again, you don't need sheet music. You can pick it up. It's an oral tradition um, and people can just join in. And so I love the idea of incorporating some of their music at protests because the whole idea is that we're joining our voices together in something that you don't need to have known before. It's a simple, repetitive uh, melody you can harmonize if you want. Um, and so there's examples of some of those kinds of short paperless songs in Voices Together that I think have really interesting connections when we're when we're doing public work um, as an example yeah and you could go even further to to say that everything we do is worship i mean beyond sunday um other places that would have hymnals would be um schools mennonite schools and camps and um hospitals you you need um pastors need prayers to say at hospitals and home visits and all kinds of places that aren't just in a church building with a group of people. And um, of course it can become um, meaningless if you say everything is worship, then there's nothing to talk about. But I think it's useful to always be stretching that that definition. And we did that on, um, on the Voices Together Committee, kind of thinking about um, how, how songs, if, you, if we do sing them in a church service, how do they connect to the rest of our lives? And in addition to that, what other locations and situations do we need words to say individually and corporately, say or sing? And I think even beyond that, we're just bouncing off each other. How we sing a song or how we lead a song or where we get our music from also says something about our witness. It's about how we understand God and how we share that with with our communities, both internally and externally. Um, and so really thinking about questions of um, origin of music and how we're leading and, um, you know, the accessibility of our words and our melodies and any of our harmonies and whatever our accompaniments, our instruments, all of those are questions about how we are communicating what we believe um, and how would that be perceived to someone both within or outside of your community um, from any kind of various walk of life. Yeah, in the same way that you can say that worship is everything, we could also say that witness is everything. Every, every act and everything we say proclaims what we believe. And so we need to be intentional about in our as we plan worship are we by our actions and the words we're choosing saying what we mean to say and and enacting the kind of community that we want to enact and then um again all the all of the uh connections to outside of work outside of to traditional traditional definitions of worship how do those um, how do we proclaim what we believe in many many different ways Annalie, going back to the first part of your answer, you mentioned, uh, you know, public protests as connected to worship in some way. I think that's not something uh, that a lot of people necessarily think about. I know in the, the new issue of Anabaptist Witness, you had some articles that talked about different kinds of protest, um, congregations coordinating on putting out yard signs, you know, with political messaging and so forth. How do we think about protests and other actions like that um, as forms of worship? 
Yeah, we we wanted to um, we invited um, Amy Yoder McLaughlin to we knew she's thinking about these things about protest as worship. And so we invited her to write an essay for this um, for this issue. And um, and she talks about specifically for um, protests about immigration because of um, because of ISIS. Uh, it's not a law, but it's sort of an in-house um, uh, rule that they follow that they don't disrupt worship services, and that's why people can take sanctuary in churches. And so um, in Philadelphia, there's a group that makes if if there's an ice raid or something they they surround it and start singing and turn it into a worship service to to try to create this uh, this feeling that ice should be there and that it worked every time but um but it's just and, and she spits that out more of how she personally thinks of it as worship and how she grounds herself in her spirituality when she takes uh, action in those protests. Yeah, I think it's also interesting to reflect on for for Mennonites. Um, you know, we, I think, find so much of our identity in being social justice people who think about how we are um, justice in all kinds of various ways. Um, and we also find a lot of our identity in our worship, um, right? I think those two have interesting intersections if you think about, I mean, even just, you know, degree programs, like I'm, all my friends were church music or peace and conflict studies, you know, like we, th those, these two areas have so many intersections in our life. Um, and so, of course, connected to that, you know, protests and our worship are also, um, they they dialogue with each other uh, and and it's you know when we were writing um, so we wrote this uh, document with some um, consultants including from um, into account on what happens when worship resources are implicated in abuse um, and one of the one of the calls that we got in that writing process was that we shouldn't only talk about um, you know um, various forms of sexual violence on one Sunday a year or when it comes up, but this should be part of our worship always. This should be named in our congregational prayer. Um, and we should be attentive to how our worship may be perceived by survivors and affect their, you know, their experience and their well-being. And I think that that call goes beyond um, that these issues, protests and and uh, other forms of, you know, injustice that we speak about aren't things to only come up, you know, that one Sunday a year or right when something emergency happens or when a big something happens in the news. These are things that should be ingrained in our worship, both through congregational prayers, that's a really natural way to name them, but also can we address them in our sermons? What do our songs say? Whether they address them or not, how do they impact these issues? Um, and so kind of these these broader connections that help us help us worship more fully and also protest and be be people of action more fully too. Yeah, so this issue also in includes three congregational prayers because we wanted to include examples of those that engage um, that engage the world beyond uh, or make that link between our worship and the world beyond our worship. The, uh, another really interesting resource to highlight perhaps that's in Voices Together that kind of connects to this is the Prayer for National Occasions by Isaac Viegas, who is a friend to Anabaptist Witness. Um, and and that has gained some really interesting traction too, thinking about um, you know, justice and and nationality and um, kind of um, identity in those ways. What do we do with that? You know, how, what are, it's really interesting to consider what do Mennonite congregations do on Canada Day or the 4th of July? Um, how does our worship kind of perceive or translate what's going on in the world around us on those Sundays. And so we're excited that Voices Together contains that um, resource and that this issue also kind of helps us think about, about our Mennonite identity and what's going on in the world and how those intersect. And I mean, if you think about our Mennonite communities, worship is when we gather together. Like that's, you know, of course we're gathering to worship, but that's also our time of community building and conversation and brainstorming and, you know, church foyer conversations that lead to initiatives. And so um, when that worship encompasses these justice issues, um, they work, they work together.
Yeah, well, I'm curious to know, uh, you've talked about prayers, you've talked about some different kind of liturgical elements. Um, how does music itself, um, you know, I know there's a lot of different understandings of what music is and what music does, but from your perspectives, how do the kind of choices congregations make about music relate to these, these matters of witness? Yeah, Emily talked about that a little bit already with um, her story about growing up and how choosing music that is accessible is a way of being of being hospitable to newcomers and um, and there are of course ways to introduce songs that that are more hospitable than than others. Um, then um, and then she also talked a little bit about intentionally. Um, diversifying the music we sing so from different places and different time periods and um, music written by men and women if we can build a kind of diversity like that into our um, into our worship then we have more voices that we are worshiping with and more voices that we are um, embodying and um, it can it can open up a, a both embodying that kind of diversity and it can open up conversations about equity in that way. Yeah, I'm trying to find, I've got my worship leader edition here, our aspirations for language use, um, which is another really interesting connection between kind of what we do in worship through the words that we sing um, and, and what we do beyond worship. Um, although maybe Katie's already told us that everything is worship. So talking about within worship and beyond worship is maybe not a helpful distinction. Um, but the, these aspirations for language use that we talked about in Voices Together, I think are really helpful for um, thinking about whether you're a Voices Together using congregation or not. Thinking about how does what we're singing, um, you know, what does that say about our values and our beliefs and our theology? And that's something we think about broad scale all the time with various religious, you know, statements that we, we hold to. Um, but, you know, like one example that we, this is from our um, worship leader edition, thinking about colonialism and nationalism. So do the words we choose respect people of all nations and cultures? Do our words invite an identification with the worldwide church? Do our words assume or perpetuate imperialist worldviews? Um, and so how does, how does what we're singing um, uh, intentionally or unintentionally reflect what we are, what we're believing? And there's, you know, research and just kind of general knowledge about how w when we sing something that becomes part of our narrative um, and that's that's not a one-off we don't sing something at church and then completely disconnect ourselves from those words uh, and so it's really important to think about um, about examples of how our words may shape us and are, are the words we singing shaping us in ways that we want to be shaped and do they do they witness to a message that is what we want to be standing behind um, and so there's a whole a whole range of those aspirations but I think that's a really clear example and then musically too um, kind of like what I talked about at the beginning I mean there's this tension between um, this is not uh, you know, a binary discussion, there's not good and bad here of ways to witness through your music. For some communities that looks like adopting contemporary worship music, for some communities that looks like four part hymnody that has really um, updated their language to be really inclusive. Um, and hopefully our Mennonite communities can do both um, and experiment and go beyond our comfort zones. Um, but really thinking about how, how what we're teaching and leading in our instrumentation um, excludes or includes. Uh, and that's something Katie did a lot of work with, with intercultural worship as well. Um, thinking about, you know, beyond text even, how does the music we're being involved with, in, involved with communicate? Yeah, can I just say, she was talking about the worship leader edition of Voices Together. And if you have it, the um, discussion of the asp like aspirations for language use is number 355 called expansive and inclusive language in worship. And another way to phrase that is to, to the question of how, how do our words talk about who God is, who we are, and who we are, who God calls us to be. And so, yeah, the way we are shaped and the way our unconscious biases are shaped by words is really important, especially when we think about songs that we sing over and over and over and prayers and the types of language we use because worship 
every week saying things together and saying things out loud and singing things is a is a very formative act yeah that's wonderful to hear uh, about that resource in the worship leader edition of voices together uh and those questions you read are wonderful questions um we have a, a question from the audience that kind of goes along these lines. So I want to raise it now. Uh, this is from Orlando Redekop. And he says, I know of a church, Mennonite church in Iowa stumbling on the question of gender inclusive images of God. How have you handled this resistance? And you might say more about, you know, how do you connect? You've been talking about a variety of kinds of issues around language and so forth. How, how have you worked particularly on this, this issue around gender inclusive images for God? Yeah, there's a discussion guide on voicestogetherhymnal.org slash resources. There's lots of um, lots of resources there, but there's one specifically about um, inclusive and expansive language for God. Um, and that is that discussion guide has that quest has that language about who is God. Hey, thanks, Annalie, put it in the chat. Um, who is God? What do our words say about who God is? And um, and and who we are, th those things are, are um, connected because we are called to be God-like, we are called to follow Jesus. And um, so, yeah, so you can't, you can't um, separate those. And um, the, our, what we tried to do with Voices Together is include a balance and a variety. Anytime we, um, lock ourselves into saying the same words for God over and over, we ha we run the risk of of forgetting that it's a metaphor, that we can't really picture God, and that we can't really understand uh, God. And so the most important thing is to, that, and that's the idea of expansive language, to constantly try to expand our ideas of, of who God is. That document also has another appendix, which is also from the worship leader edition on scriptural ways to address God. Um, and that's a really helpful, a helpful kind of summary. It's, it's such a helpful resource to have to go back to, um, of just various names and images of God and the spirit and of Jesus to kind of help, help us understand the breadth of resources that are out there and how, how over history we've been drawn to some, but there are more that we can, we can lean into. That's really great that you're kind of building some of this into the the hymnal. I know from my own experience growing up in a church context in which every prayer started with Father God, <laughs> um, really having my eyes open to the diversity of, of imagery within scripture um, and the long uh, and diverse tradition of the church uh, has been personally really really helpful and it's um as you say the way that uh, different language can kind of open up or highlight uh different aspects of god's character and how god relates to us um so thank you for <laughs> for doing that work to really be intentional in building that into the hymnal and um we also have another expression of thanksgiving from sheldon burkhalter and i just want to read this note um sent in that uh, months ago when we received our personal copy of Voices Together, I, as I leafed through the pages, the thought came to read through the hymnal. So I started reading about 10 pages every night before turning out the lights, but missing the music of new hymns. I've now read it cover to cover. What a beautiful, rich experience this has been. All the hymns, scripture, and worship texts. I came to appreciate so much more the gift of poetic lines, language, and theology. Thanks to all those who invested their gifts, gifts in compiling the book. Thank you. That's really lovely. Well, thanks, Sheldon, for sharing that. And uh, we're getting to the point where we would welcome more questions from the audience. So please do uh, put your questions um, in the Q&A. Uh, and we have one from Fred Redekop asking how our worship has changed as we move to Zoom and online services. Yeah, that's a big question. That's in many ways. <laughs> right, right. I mean, we all, all, I'm sure anyone who's attended a service has noticed these differences. I mean, one that comes up um, 
for me is thinking about how our worship is both more flexible and less flexible. Um, we are limited in what resources we have access to in terms of, um, you know, we want to sing the song, but we don't have a recording of it. Do we have an accompanist who can make a recording? Do we have a virtual choir? We are limited. We can't just do things on the fly like we may be used to. But we also have so many more options um, because because we can be more flexible in many regards. Um, and I think some of the expectation of maybe performance has diminished. We we know that we're in this pandemic and no one is is you know, operating at 100% in many ways, just in terms of, of how we're able to do worship. And so we're able to just kind of lower our guard and be, you know, more impromptu and add in a resource we might not have added in um, and change things and re respond in different ways. And so there's these pros and cons and this tension. But I think in regard to witness, um, that kind of flexibility that comes with it does allow us to address what's going on in the world. Um, I think there have been really interesting um, online forums that have come into play. One, this, one that comes to mind that folks should check out if they haven't on Instagram, which I don't know how many of you have Instagram, but is um, Black Liturgies as an account. Um, I think they may be on Facebook too. Um, and really interesting, really interesting resources to resource some of the, you know, awful events that have been happening um, and giving us language to be able to acknowledge those in worship. And so that that's an example of this kind of flexibility we have and these resources that have emerged. Um. Yeah, I think another thing I've seen is that it's made us think more clearly about what our worship does and what is necessary. So, um, I mean, a lot of things are more difficult to do online, and so you just drop it if it's not necessary. Or, for example, if we're doing, if we want to do communion on Zoom, you have to think through what really is important about communion and how can we do it? How can we get to the kernel of meaning or, or the um, variety of meanings that we want to, to have in this ritual today on Zoom, and how can we do that? As opposed to when things are when we do them over and over, sometimes we just go through the motions or we think we know what they mean, but we're not thinking, we're not, we, we're not forced to think through them every time we, we do them. I, I see a question from James Crable, who is one of the contributors to the uh, forthcoming issue of Anabaptist Witness. Uh, James asks, or says, you reference the importance of working toward diversity in worship. I'm assuming that includes some level of commitment to multicultural intercultural worship, both in our local communities, increasingly in our awareness of the global faith family. But then there's the thorny challenge of appropriation. So Annalie and Katie, talk to us about how to navigate the commitment to both diversity and the avoidance of misappropriation. Yeah. Yeah, so um, James Crable and Janie Blau uh, wrote an article for this uh, issue of Anabaptist Worship about the history of Anabaptist missions and how it has um, affected global Anabaptist worship. And um, I also, I think I saw Robert Thiessen's name on, on here as well. He also wrote about um, uh, mission and worship and how it's interesting because you can see the power, the difference in power dynamics when people talk about how um, mission um, church plants or or churches that arise from mission from Western sources need to think about um, creating indigenous worship, worship that is indigenous to them and using not not only taking songs from um, from foreign places, but but developing worship of their own that, that is appropriate to their culture. And in North America, we almost have the flip side of that, that we need to be aware of worship cultures around the world and recognize that we don't own Christianity as, as Westerners or North Americans, and that we don't have the only correct ways to worship or that our hymns are better than um, than other cultures, uh, Christian music. So the, um, so part of, um, that's, that's all, I haven't gotten to James's question at all yet. Um, so I think what I always say is that we, we have to balance the, the tension there that we have, that we need to do it. We need to be, um, engaging in, we, I'm, I, and I'm talking for myself as a white North American person now, um, that 
uh, we need to engage in worship cultures from around the world and songs from different cultures in order for, for me to remind myself that I don't own Christianity, that God is bigger than my culture, that God speaks the languages of the, the entire world. And at the same time, the other part of the tension is, is this question of misappropriation or cultural appropriation that it's, it's also, there are very good reasons to, to not uh, put, use my voice to sing um, words from other places that I can't really identify with in my own personal, like, like slave spirituals. Who, who am I to be, to sing those songs when I have never experienced that? Um, so I, I think we, we have to recognize the tension and not let it paralyze us. And, um, we can move forward in a spirit of humility and a, a spirit of prayerfulness and a spirit of, um, once again, back to the, the theme of connecting uh, our worship to our life beyond the worship service is that that none of these um, singing of diversity or worshiping with diversity should end there. We should um, we should connect it to learning and to um, political protests or whatever, uh, however you uh, are involved in um, in politics or these issues, learning and welcoming people in and, um, and other actions so that so that the our worship life is grounded in the rest of our life and vice versa. And uh, this may, you may have answered this, but Robert Thiessen, who was just mentioned, uh, sends in a question that I think um, maybe asked for some of the kind of the practi a practical question related to what you're just talking about, Katie. So how does the need for an emerging church to worship in indigenous forms balance with older churches um, to adopt broader forms? How do old, in quotes, old churches help emerging groups, especially in migrant situations, feel free to utilize their own cultural forms? Do you have any kind of pastoral advice for that, those kind of situations? Um, I, I think that that's hard to talk about generally because it would be so, there would be so many different types of situations that, um, that this could, uh, that, that this could emerge from different types of cultural interactions. But I think the the relationships are important and um, understanding one another. I mean, if, if we're talking about migrants, immigrants in North America and welcoming people into our congregation and encouraging them, like the, the relationship and willingness of me to sing your songs just as much as you are singing my songs if you come to my church um yeah i'm not i'm not sure i think i think the kind of pastoral care thing that you you just mentioned is a big thing um that has felt like a big thing throughout our voices together process too that we have a sense of where we want to be um and what is maybe ideal um worship on many levels but there's also there's also sometimes we need to sing the songs that are heart songs to us um, and we need to, we need to, you know, sing the songs that our neighbors want to sing. And so there's this tension between where we want to be and how fast we may want to move and what the ideal is um, and, and what worship that's sensitive and attuned to the congregation um, and that meets their needs is. And so I don't think there's a clear cut answer on those. They're just two, two pieces that we hold in tension and that can be kind of translated onto that question and others that it's this push and pull and rest kind of um uh tension that we hold yeah and that it's work it's hard work and it's never done mm -hmm. we we you can't just sing a song from another culture and check that box and you you don't have to do it again um you need to continually cultivate and part of worship is cultivating habits of thought and uh, and of being, and so building um, building multiculturalism and diversity and respect for others into the into those repeated actions is is important. So when you talk about some of these matters of intercultural diversity, um, unity and diversity, you know one of the primary biblical theological frameworks that Christians 
have used to address those questions has been the paradigm of reconciliation. And Mennonites have heavily invested in this concept of reconciliation, um, the way that the church itself and the, our membership and gathering unites, formerly warring people that, you know, Ephesians 2, the dividing wall has been broken down in our worshiping communities. And so there is a kind of uh, Mennonite theology of worship that is centered on reconciliation. And yet we've known, or we have been learning, I'll say, and many of us have been learning, um, many have known for a long time, um, but that an emphasis on reconciliation uh, as the kind of immediate goal can be used to kind of manipulate and silence um, righteous calls for justice and repair. And I know this is something that some of the authors in the, the new issue of Anabaptist Witness work on, and perhaps it's something that you've thought about in terms of the kind of relationship between worship and reconciliation. So I wonder what you would say, how do we think about worship as reconciling, or can we do that? Should we do that? Yeah, there's an article in, um, in this new issue about a, a congregation's journey toward inclusiveness of LGBTQ people and how reconciliation is important to their worship and their witness. And so precisely what you're talking about. Um, and kind of off of that, how their worship enacted their reconciliation. The worship was necessary in order for that congregation to experience reconciliation. Um, keep going. Um, <laughs> Now I cut yeah. you off, it's my bad. That, that speaks to the, the question. I mean, it, so I, the article um, that you're referring to from what I've seen of it and from some of the other pieces in the, the journal that touch on this, it seems to envision a, a form kind of a renewal or revision to a kind of more traditional Mennonite theology of reconciliation that includes and incorporates uh, yeah, and that article talks about the pain along the way, and um, it's not, yeah, it's not all, as you said, the, the, the idea of reconciliation um, being used to make it, make it appear nice and, mm -hmm. and um, happy, and that's, yeah, that's definitely something that Mennonites need to work on, I think, and, like digging into reconciliation in all of its messiness and its, and its pain and everything else that needs that comes along with it. Well, thanks for reflecting on that topic as well as all the many uh, different topics we've talked about here. This is all the time we have left for today. Um, we will be posting the recording, uh, the video recording of this discussion on uh, our Anabaptist Witness social media accounts, as well as our website. You can also find recordings of our past three webinars, um, again, on our social media and website. Um, and you can learn more about Anabaptist Witness um, on, we have Facebook, Twitter, and we actually are on Instagram now. Um, so if you're checking out some of the resources Anna Lee mentioned, you can check out Anabaptist Witness as well. Um, our website is www.anabaptistwitness.org, and in the next week or so, you will see this issue that has been so expertly and well edited by Katie and Annalie. Thank you for that, and thank you so much um, for being with us uh, on our webinar, Katie and Annalie. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. um, just as a final word, I'll say Anabaptist Witness is a project of Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary. Mennonite Central Committee, Mennonite Church Canada, and Mennonite Mission Network. And I want to give a special thanks to Marcos Acosta, um, who has been, for the last couple of years, my assistant on Anabaptist Witness. Um, and he is graduating here in the next, in, in, next weekend. Um, he's been the one who has been organizing these webinars and setting them up. And so big thank you to Marcos for all your help. Uh, we are hoping to do another series of these webinars um, uh, in coming months, so please stay tuned to our, uh, our, our social media accounts and email um, updates, and we'll alert you to those. But once again, many thanks to you all for joining us, and a special thanks to Katie and Annalie. Bye, everybody.